Welcome to Professor Game Podcast, where we interview successful practitioners of games, gamification, and game thinking, who bring us the best of their experiences to get ideas, insights, and inspiration that help us in the process of getting the students to learn what we teach. And I'm Rob Alvarez. I teach and work at IE Business School in Madrid, where we create interactive and engaging learning materials. Want to know more? Go to professorgame.com slash subscribe, start on our email list, and ask me anything. So hello, engagers. We are once again here, and today we are with Dan Norton of Filament Games. But before we introduce Dan, we have to know here, the engagers have to know, Dan, are you prepared to engage? I am always prepared to engage. <laughs> Let's do this. Let's go, because... As the chief creative officer and co-founder of Filament Games, Dan Norton is overseeing Filament's design team and works on continuously improving the company's design process. Dan has designed games about a uniquely broad of range of topics, ranging from marine turtle ecology to legal argumentation. So his games have not won numerous industry awards and have been played by millions of times in the classrooms across the country, which is the U.S. Dan approaches each new project at Filament as an opportunity to find authentic passion and engagement around learning new things, blending his love for game design with his love of collaborative creativity to support and lead the Filament design and artistic practices. So is there anything we're missing from that intro, Dan? No, I think that's, you know... That's makes me feel good hearing it. It's very wholesome. <laughs> yeah, it's no, that, that pretty much covers it. It's uh, uh, yeah, my career yeah started at you know doing uh as a game designer on small team, and now I oversee other designers working on small teams. So it's been a really cool sort of moving forward. But those those same ideas of trying to create interesting and meaningful game mechanics has been the the big theme. <laughs> Awesome, awesome. Because Dan, we want to get started with what does a regular day with Dan look like? If if we were Dan Norton today, what would it feel like? What would be we be doing? What what is it? You know, a regular day. What, what what if we were in your shoes? What would it look like? Okay. Well, I actually I just bought some really nice new like bright yellow uh, Onitsuka Tigers. So <laughs> in my shoes today is actually really uh, it's a great day to be in my shoes. But I I think if I were to sort of boil my day down into sort of three main roles. Uh, I kind of, I participate at Filament at at multiple sort of different stages of of it. So uh, I still do design, so I'm still design on projects sort of intermittently or pinch hitting at Filament. So uh, some parts of my day are met, are working with clients to create design documentation, working with teams to help uh, design and plan and process uh, the projects. I also oversee the design team, so I'm meeting with them on the regular basis and sort of helping troubleshoot uh, thorny design problems or collaboration challenges they find. And then the last sort of bucket is I'm I'm one of the founding partners of Filament, so I'm meeting with the other two founding partners and we're trying to peg out sort of the bigger picture of what's next for Filament, what are the important sort of initiatives we need to work on next or projects and growth, et cetera. So my day is a little schizophrenic. um, And sometimes I feel like, you know, my calendar kind of is telling me what's going to happen and less less me, you know, designing my calendar. But, uh, you know, it's all interesting, uh, interesting challenges. And and for me, that's like the the main drive is, yeah, it's never boring. So that's great. (laughs) For game designer, that's, I'm sure, is one of the main objectives of a day. As, I, as you can attest to, I'm sure. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> so Dan, we're going to switch now into not just a regular day, but actually what you would call maybe your favorite failure or your f- f- favorite fail or first attempt in learning. And how, of course, how that challenge came to be, how you did to overcome it or solve it, or, you know, move on and go into other things. And what especially we want to get into what you learned from that challenge? Like, let us know what, what did that look like and, and what can we profit from, so to speak, from, from your experience? Yeah, this was, this was uh, when, this is a really tough question for me because I, you know, I've, I've failed so many times. <laughs> uh, <laughs> and, 
I try to think about what's the one that has the most sort of actionable uh, actionable thing on the other side. So uh, I think maybe a nice useful story is uh, less so of, I guess, yeah, we can call it a failure. So I think about... It can always be initial failure, you know, we, we overcome failure as well. I'm trying to, yeah, all right, let me think about it. Yeah, so basically maybe five years or so ago, was, I was working on probably what I would call sort of my first systems-driven game, like super heavily driven systems game, uh, where the game itself was uh, supposed to be, uh, again, focusing on systems analysis, right? So the game was supposed to be about having the player understand how to work through a system, and sort of figure out the anatomy of it, how it works, and, and how the parts each relate to each other. So, so the game we designed uh, was uh, built around the idea that you were in control of a small group of nomadic traders uh, that were these various little charming animal traders in a desert. And you, uh, they would move around this desert uh, not by your direct control, but by you setting sort of artificial intelligence priorities for them. Right, so you tell them like, hey, it's really important to try and gather trinkets, uh, but also be willing to trade trinkets for water if you're running low. Right, so you'd set up little sort of uh, logic rules for them, and then your merchants would head out into the desert and see how much profit they could make. So uh, the goal for the player uh, is to you know try and cyclically. Uh, refine their understanding of the system and the other agents in the system to try and design a set of rules to inhabit that system that's the most effective. Um, and so all that was cool. Um, but holy cow, that game was miserable uh, <laughs> um, for almost the entirety of development. And because what I really hadn't understood uh, until I really dealt with that game is that when you're ga designing a game that's governed by systems, until you actually get to the tuning of those systems based on the player experience, everything will feel like garbage. Um, you can make a game about jumping or running or shooting or you know basically any other sort of core verb mechanic, and you can kind of work on that mechanic until it feels great and then sort of work your way out. But when your core mechanic is interacting with a system, if that system isn't balanced right out of the gate, uh, you will really have a super hard time getting any meaningful data about how to improve your play experience. Um, you can still get usability, you know, for interface, etc. Right? You can still work on those things, but until you actually find a reasonable enough starting tune for a game that's driven by those systems, you're just kind of dead in the water. And so I had a long period of, of angst uh, trying to figure out whether this game would ever be any good at all. Uh, because we just couldn't get to that initial tune that felt like you could make decisions that mattered. Um, ultimately, we got there. Uh, the game was cool. We released it. It was sort of a research project, so it didn't wind up being like a, a public release project, but in terms of its internal goals for the client, it, was, it went really well in classrooms and uh, was very cool. But that was definitely a tough time for me as a designer because I, I just... Normally, I try and have sort of kind of like a, uh, a Willy Wonka-ish kind of flair. Just like, don't worry, we'll, we'll get through all this weird stuff and it'll be great on the other side. <laughs> and on that project, I just wasn't sure. I was like, I don't know. I don't know if there's a game on the other side. So if you had to face something similar, which you probably have after this experience, what would you say is a key lesson or something that you would implement maybe differently Maybe something you would think of in advance. You're talking about the balance in the system. Maybe maybe how to balance it from the get go. What what would be something that maybe you would approach differently in a similar project nowadays? I think uh, there's sort of two ways to go about it. I think the cooler answer, if I had it, would be like, oh well, here's a super efficient way to do systems testing very quickly, even without a tuned environment to understand uh, how it works. And you can probably do that with sort of dummied up responses and get some, uh, you know, like mocked up uh, feedback structures to sort of simulate some of the play outcomes you'd like to see. But I don't, I don't know if I can actually endorse that as a great solution, just because you're now spending time building systems that you know you won't keep. Um, so I guess timeline allowing uh, 
that would be a cool way to spend some of your initial uh, design development time is working on placeholder systems mechanics just to look at player response. But especially at Filament where, you know, we work on uh, projects for clients almost exclusively. Um, and those projects have uh, pretty fixed timelines, you know, based on both budget and also clients, you know, needing to be able to roll out and use the things we make for them, you know, at a, at a certain time. So I can't make just an, you know, across the board recommendation that that is a great way to spend initial time. I think probably my less good but more pragmatic answer is if you believe in the systems gameplay and you can think of parallels to similar systems gameplay structures that you have uh, encountered that you are confident can be implemented, then just hang on tight and don't freak out. <laughs> and work on your tuning and get there, get there when you get there. Um, so I think... Uh, that's probably my less spectacular answer, but is the one that, you know, if I were wound up in the middle of another ultra systems driven game is what I would really approach it being like, no, I, I can believe in these systems mechanics, the principles and the design are solid. We'll get there through the tune. Uh, it'll just take more time. And as long as your schedule is ready for that time to find it, you'll be okay. Basically, it might be to schedule in enough time <laughs> for yeah. these kinds of flaws that you might find. And in, in a 180 degree spin to this, what would you say is a story of actually a success of your designs as Dan Norton, maybe in filament, maybe before, whatever you want to go to? And of course, what do you think were the key lessons for, for such a success in a game? Okay, interesting. Um, I think I'll go, I'll go like way back. Uh, like when we started Filament, um, there were three of us, so the founding partners, and we're, we're still the still the owners of Filament. And uh, when we started Filament, a game development shop, or basically any business, sort of has kind of like gradations of real as it as it comes into being, right? You know, so I think I forget whether business cards or technically incorporating came first, but you know, those were these big milestones. Like I can I can hand you a piece of paper that has my name on it. That's that means we're a real company. <laughs> um, right, so there's like these little steps, and so early on in Filament, you know, we're at the point where we exist as a company, just barely. Um, we'd gotten a little bit of consulting work, which was great, um, but we're also working on our own internal prototypes, which is you know the fancy, fancy version of saying no one's paying us to make anything yet. Um, so we started working on a, a very ambitious uh, ocean science prototype uh, uh, where we would uh, the, the premise of the game is you'd be an underwater uh, ocean researcher working on an alien planet and this was going to be a game in classrooms was our initial idea where students would all take on the roles of different uh, underwater ocean researchers uh, and they would get commissioned from various different companies or governments to conduct different types of research in this alien underwater world. So you could do creature surveys or pollution surveys or look for types of resources. And each one of the funders would have like a different perspective. You know, one might be interested in trying to drill for some rare minerals or another one might be looking for fisheries or another one might be an ecological preservation organization. And so each one of those organizations would be funding a particular type of research and it'd be up to you to find and secure funding for the type of work you want to do. And in your classroom, all of the kids would, you know, then be competing with each other, like in a, in a real academic environment to try and print, uh, you know, their articles and these video game and trying journals and sort of compete to each other in the same sort of scientific field. It was a wildly ambitious game. Uh, we never finished it. Um, but uh, the thing I'm really proud of is that that game was something we set up and proposed as a design with that even now, if it were to be made in, in schools, it would be really challenging to whether or not it would even be possible in schools. Uh, we were wildly ambitious uh, about our dream for what could happen inside schools. Uh, we thought we could create authentic uh, cultures of scientific inquiry and discourse with the game. And that project is something that we sort of started taking out and showing people as a, in our prototype mode just to like just to start the conversation about what we thought would be possible with games and learning 
And that actually led to uh, my partner, Dan White, uh, showing it at a conference. Um, and that got a funder from the Kauffman Foundation excited, and they wound up partnering us with an, uh, an organization called the Jason Project, which uh, is a subsidiary of National Geographic, uh, to start tailoring a version of that game, more pragmatic version of that game, and then other science games to go with their their science curriculum. And that was kind of when Phil and I got off to the races. So I'm very proud of, and I consider it a big success, that you know we have a lot of big hopes and dreams about how games can change learning and how a positive impact can change game design. It was, it was a foundational success. <laughs> it was a foundational success. And sort of that, that dream of having, uh, having games change how people learn or how having games change people's lives. And then at the same time, helping create new context to understand how games can be powerful and important. Um, it was just nice to set out with that and get a positive response that let us sort of continue continue our work from there on out. Fantastic. So, Fantastic. Yeah. And in that work, I'm assuming that you have, um, and of course, reveal as much as you can, but I'm assuming you follow some sort of process. You do maybe a series of steps. When Imagining somebody comes into your office now and says, I want to do this educational or learning game. What would be maybe the, the broad steps that you would take to get that to fruition, to actually turn that into a real learning game that, that is used in classrooms or wherever this person or company is taking it towards? Sure. Yeah, that's a great question. Um, the way it works is that so, so filament, uh, really filament's design methodology is, is, is really designed to solve that that very particular thing in a very particular way. So the first thing that we do is we try and actually isolate and get documented the learning objectives or the impact objectives. So, you know, we want to know from our client, what is it that you'd like someone to know or what type of change would you like to affect in the person who's played this? Um, ideally that what they know or how they've been changed is something that is taken into account as a, a change that is happens after they've played, so something they can walk away from the game and be better from. Um, and also, a lot of the time, we'll talk about whether or not it's measurable in some way, right? or whether it's something that we can actually you know, do some type of study and find out if people actually had, had learned those things or had been transformed. That just helps you know, really clarify the goals of what sort of needs to happen inside the game so we know whether or not we can call it a success. Once those have been identified, those, sort of, those core objectives, Uh, we really use kind of the same three design strategies over and over and over and over. Um, and those really briefly are uh, identity, systems, and verbs. When I say identity, I'm basically sort of talking about how oh, games are very unique and powerful in a medium and that they can set you up to be someone you're not. So not just, oh, you can read the story about someone else or watch and care about a character on a screen, but you literally are given a identity and that you enter and you have this kind of interesting merged identity where you're you and you're also someone else. And uh, games, commercial and otherwise, have all sorts of different ways of setting up that relationship. You know, sometimes you're... Sometimes you're a person with a name. Uh, sometimes you're just a role. Uh, sometimes you have a voice that you know the game provides dialogue. Sometimes you have a choice. Sometimes you say nothing at all. Um, so there's all these decisions about how to model identity for you that really change how you interact and you know experience a game. You know, I think one of the more easy and sort of interesting examples might be like you know Half Life, right? The Gordon Freeman characters react to you by name. You have a, a job, and you are, you know, you are transformed into a hero without ever saying a word. But the way people react to you and the things you do sort of really shape that identity. And people really have, you know, people want to know who Gordon Freeman is, and uh, and how to be Gordon Freeman is, 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 you know, really a critical part of the game. But yeah, so when we look at our learning objectives or impact objectives in a uh, that we are given with a client. We can ask ourselves, you know, are, are any of these about seeing the world from a particular point of view uh, or understanding or empathizing with a different perspective? And if the answer to those things is yes, then we'll consider whether or not we can model 
model that identity in the game and sort of grant it to the player and let them sort of merge with it as part of their play experience. And if so, then we expect that to be a pretty transformational way to do it. Um, nice. Yeah. Should I, should I keep on going? or? Um, yeah, if you can, can summarize in a couple of minutes, it would be great. There's two to go. Uh, the next one is uh, systems, um, which actually, yeah, I've already sort of talked a little bit about some of the tricks of systems design. But uh, so, uh, yeah, games are made of rules uh, as, you know, sort of one way to reduce it, right? Games are a set of interactions and capabilities and restraints. And when you play a game, understanding and testing and ultimately sort of mastering those rules is usually a key component of becoming good at it. So if you want to make a game that's driven by systems for learning, you need objectives then that are about some type of system. Right. So if you're making a game about like an, an ecosystem or maybe how the human body works or, uh, you know, like I mentioned before, systems analysis is kind of an uncannily nice alignment. Um, if you're yeah. So if your learning objectives are about some type of complicated set of rules that depend on each other for context in order to explain themselves, then you can engineer those rules into the fabric of your game world and have the player inhabit them. And then mastering the game will be the uh, really, really closely tied to mastering understanding of that system. An example of that could be like when you were saying it, I was thinking of some example that's been, I've heard it several times of how do students learn or how do players learn, you know, all these potions and in, in, in potions in, in many games and how they mix together and what you need to get together to bring this and that. And then they say, well, but they can't figure out um, anything in you know in the lab or in chemistry and so on so maybe actually embedding that as a and then you know bringing it out and saying well that potion you created there is this and that and that so like bringing that out would be an example of having a system that has all these rules and actually the learning objective is to understand how these interact and then you know bringing yeah. that out of the game so to speak absolutely right yeah so uh, players if players are given the right sort of scaffolding and the right ways to sort of fail and experiment gracefully, then you, you can give them pretty brutal arrays of interaction that they'll just want to learn more about. We made a game about uh, energy profiles for growing cities, actually back with, with the Jason project that I mentioned earlier. And so that was a game about how you could spend your time developing new types of energy plants for a city as it grew. You could spend money on researching energy efficiencies. Um, and you also had to sort of work with the stakeholders in the city to try and meet their goals and keep the city powered and people happy while you're moving the, the city's energy portfolio forward through time and technology. Um, so that was a pretty, uh, that was a systems game, right? Because we wanted to really point at the idea that energy as a problem and opportunity is complex. There's lots of different stakeholders. There's lots of ways to approach it. And uh, I think that was actually a, very, a pretty successful game. Um, we released uh, just a, like an early playtest version of that game. Actually, it's funny to bring this up because uh, it ties to my earlier description of failure. And we had a version of the game when it was just impossible. Like you were absolutely destroyed by the energy metrics as they moved over time. And there's no possible way to power the city. It's just, you know, not yet tuned. You know, the systems were just brought online. Um, but our client had a, uh, the, our client's brother actually was, decided they wanted to try it. And they hammered at this thing for like six or seven hours because they were convinced there must <laughs> be a way. There's got to be a way of just threading the needle of investing in this and then buying that and then bartering for this, like, you know, working through the system. They, they were, you know, they, they, they had locked on to the passion of the idea that the context of the system was complex enough that they could find a way through. Uh, and they gave it their darndest. Uh, so they did way better than anyone thought you could, but I still couldn't beat it because it was, you know, uh, untuned pile of, uh, pile of gibberish at that point. But, you know, just, just being able to sort of ignite that systems and rule testing, experimenting passion was like a really good sign for us. We're like, okay, you know, if they're willing to play it now when it's terrible, I think, I think we're onto something. So, yeah. And you had a, a third, uh, aspect to consider what would that be yes the last one is maybe the most direct i maybe i should have led with it but it's uh verbs uh so uh you know in games you do things 
Uh, you know, you are given sort of abilities and often constraints uh, of what you can do. And then the usually the player is given some type of action they can take. And then once they demonstrate mastery over that action, uh, they're usually either given some way to complicate that action or make it more challenging, or they're given some new additional way to interact with the world. The most, uh, you know, I think the most classic example is something like uh, the Legend of Zelda series. Um, they're the, you know, the famous, famous structure of entering a dungeon. You have some sort of struggle with a dungeon where it's kind of difficult to navigate. Uh, but then at a certain point, you unlock a chest and then, well, hey, look, it's a boomerang. Um, and then when you know it, the rest of that dungeon, including the places you already explored, boomeranging is, is the most useful thing you could be doing. <laughs> and then you get to the very bottom of the dungeon and there's a big giant monster. And what do you know? The most important thing to do in order to deal with that monster is being really good at boomeranging. So that sort of cycle of giving you a new verb, reinterpreting the environment with it, and then really testing your mastery of it is part of what makes Zelda feel so good. Um, and when you get to the next dungeon, right, you, you, the, the boomerang is just part of your toolkit. And you know when to use a boomerang and when not to. Absolutely. Absolutely. I forget which Zelda it was. In one of those Zeldas, they designed it so you could enter any dungeon and acquire its item, and it would still be applicable in other dungeons so it was a non-linear tool progression the first ones actually the the i think both of the ness and super ness um had that characteristic because i i do remember um getting into dungeons that were basically almost impossible because you didn't you didn't have oh, you were not ready yeah. for it i feel like there was a mobile one where they really they really made it so that you really had a smooth entry point no matter where you went huh. like you would never be like, oh, this is impossible. It was like they did it. I don't remember. But yeah, so anyway, that concept <laughs> of introducing a new action, giving you purpose, context, and scaffolding how to get good at it, and then being able to really demonstrate, you know, have the player demonstrate their master of it is a very, very smooth and wonderful way to sort of introduce a, ma a mastery into gameplay for a player. So if our learning objectives just have a thing that we need you to be able to do. And then we say, oh, you know, we can make a digital metaphor that represents that action very well, right? We can, we can figure out a way to like turn that verb into something that's digital. Then we can turn it into a gameplay action that we give the player and then give them that context and scaffolding and mastery trajectory to get really good at it. And maybe a, an easy filament example for a game that we have out and about uh, we made it some years ago, so it's not exactly the freshest of the fresh, but it's still very charming. Uh, it's called uh, Crazy Plant Shop, and that's a game about uh, dominant and recessive traits as understood through Punnett squares. Um, so in that game, you have this little charming plant shop that has all these sorts of fantastical plants, and you have customers come in who want different variants of those plants. So you have this sort of Punnett square-driven science fiction machine in the back of your shop that lets you actually select the dominant and recessive traits via a Punnett square interface to breed the plant you want. So in that game, the Punnett square is just like the core mechanic. You Punnett square your way through every single plant decision that you make uh, and make you know all the different versions of different combinations of dominant and recessive traits that you need to succeed in the game. Um, so when you come out of the other side of that, you've, you've done, you know, countless Punnett squares and you know intimately how those work. So uh, it's a very nice cyclical gameplay structure with, you know, unlocking new plants, new customers, upgrading your shop, right? So there's a lot of scaffolding and adding to the complexity of the problem, but it's all built around that core verb of completing a Punnett square. And it, and it feels really good. Great. Great. That's great. Just a quick break before we continue with this episode. If you've been enjoying this podcast, I would really appreciate if you share it with your friends and family and on social media. On Twitter and Instagram, it's at Rob Alvarez B and the hashtag Professor Game, all one word. And in Facebook, you can find the Professor Game page. Thanks in advance for your engagement. What would you say is something that you would consider sort of a, a best practice or, or something that almost any, any game gamification or a game design project for education could, can benefit from? 
Sure. Um, well, you know, I would like to talk. I think I think a really nice best practice is actually around the word gamification. Gamification is a term that means different things to different people. And obviously in my little nook of the game design world, we've had to think about what gamification means a lot because we were asked to apply game design thinking to traditionally things you wouldn't apply game design to, you know? So uh, things like, yeah, like we said, turtle science, but there are, you know, empathy, attention practices, uh, yeah, so we, we're sort of asked, hey, how do you get game out of these non-game origins over and over? So the word gamification uh, carries a lot of weight for us. Um, the way that we treat gamification, and I would love to impart this because I would love to be able to walk around the world and have this be a shared vocabulary for everybody. Um, when we talk about gamification and filament, we're talking about game design uh, strategies and mechanics that are content agnostic. So things like points or badges uh, or avatar upgrades or cosmetics, um, almost all of these are sort of like terminal points on a reward system where you can have them, you can give them, people to varying degrees will get a positive uh, feedback from them, but they're not game structures that feed back into the game experience. They, they are, and they can be applied to almost anything, right? Like you could have avatar upgrades slapped onto the side of solitaire, right? Like, hey, unlock, unlock different card backs, you know, you get it, <laughs> uh, right? So uh, gamification for me is, a, is those set of content agnostic uh, reward structures, uh, which I'm not opposed to at all. I love card backs. I stopped playing Hearthstone for several months, and now I regret not having several card backs, even though they're absolutely pointless. Uh, but you know, it, you know, there's there's lots of positive uh, positive juice to be had out of content agnostic reward structures. Okay, but there is a but. So let's get to yes, it. Yes, there it is. The the but is that that is not actually enough to actually use the real power of games to create uh, games for positive impact. What you really want to do if you want to make an impactful and meaningful game is not just reward someone for showing up and hitting the button you requested, but to try and recontextualize what they're learning as a meaningful problem or an interesting problem placed in a context, an identity, and a system that matters. Uh, so designing the mechanics to actually represent and authentically embed that content or impact goal is what real design for impact is. So you will you will pull your gamification tools out of the toolbox while designing a game, but if that is all you've got, um, you really haven't actually used any of the real potential for game based game based learning or games for positive impact. You've just you've just taken a traditional tool and added a couple of light reward structures on top. <laughs> Yeah, I've heard I've heard it before. The whole gamification is a reward system, and again, as you mentioned from the start, um, gamification can mean different things for different people. And if that's your definition for what you feel gamification is about, I completely agree with you that there's so much more to be taken out of that. But I would like to make you another question, and that question is: If after listening to these questions and all the jazz that we've had in this interview, is there something or actually somebody that you would like to listen to answering these questions in Professor Game in another in another episode? Oh, interesting. Um, I, actually, I would be surprised if you haven't had them on yet, but have you had Jesse Shell? Yes, he, he might be on very, very soon or already have been after this interview. I'm not sure okay. how that's <laughs> going to play out, but it, it is absolutely, he's probably one of the most requested guests as well of the podcast, but it is a fantastic recommendation for sure. Yeah. I mean, Jesse Shell, uh, Shell Games does a lot of great work in the serious games field too. Um, I'm a big admirer, both, both of the work they do. And you know, honestly, I, I do like to read about game design. I am kind of a curmudgeon uh, about book recommendations, but you know, Jesse Shell's uh, book of lenses is like the most easy recommendation whenever anyone asks me. <laughs> so there you go. We have a book recommendation as well. 
And what would you yeah. say? <laughs> what yeah. would you say is is your favorite? We've been talking about game designers, the books of game designer designers, your own game design. But I would like to know what is your favorite game? You know, I saw. Oh, oh, it's so tough, right? Because I, you know, I'm <laughs> I just turned 41 years old, and I have been playing games since the Apple IIe. My dad was an electrical engineer, so I've just had I've had games you know, right around the same time that I, you know, was picking up basic literacy skills, right? So there's so many different ways to approach, like, what your favorite game is. Um, right now, uh, what I'm just started playing Borderlands 3, um, that's what's going to take the most hours out of my life for at least a short period of time. <laughs> I can't tell you if it's game of my favorite game. I, I probably not. It seems good. Uh, it's more Borderlands. It, it still makes me laugh, and uh, still, it still is occasionally strikingly dark, which is, I, I usually like that combination of humor and strikingly dark. In terms of games that just sort of... But that, that's actually a pretty, a pretty good recommendation, Dan. There's, um, there's all sorts of answers to this question. I always like to leave it open so that you, you guys and girls are are bring out whatever it is that comes to your mind and that's a spectacular thing like it could be the latest game it could be the game from you started with your in your infancy what you like the most it could be many things and and that's actually actually having the latest one is is also a fantastic answer that i've had a few times as well after over 100 episodes it, it makes sense <laughs> that there are one or two strategies that have already already been used by some of our guests and I would like to know, Dan, as well, you've been talking about what you guys do. I know you, you're doing, you have like three different roles, but in, in a few words, what would you say is your superpower as a game designer? Oh, okay, sure. Um, I, I like that question because I am actually a very particular type of designer and I'm not even, my design team isn't really even that composed of folks who approach it quite the way I do. I am, uh, I really, I love working with people. And I love creative problem solving, and I love to try and make sure that I'm fostering a positive space for creative communication to solve problems. Um, so when I think about design, I think about it as I'm looking to try and solve all the problems on making a game that no one else wants to, uh, rather than I need to take all the best problems for myself. Uh, and I try and really activate and engage the team to be as empowered to solve the problems that they're excited about and good at as, as I can. So that's very different. I have some, I have some excellent designers who uh, very meticulously will, will work their way through and make sure that they've covered every possible angle of confusion or clarity, and they will work their way through all of the components of every problem so that everyone is ready to go with what they need. But I, I just intrinsically want to turn all of those into the, in my mind, the best collaborative solution that I can find working with <laughs> everyone else. So that's great. Yeah. So I, 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 I yeah, I also, uh, similarly paired, I really like to make the decisions that ensure that we can go forward. And I like to postpone the decisions that I think are too early to make until I need to make them later. So <laughs> I like, to, I like to tell the team, you know, uh, uh, we'll burn that bridge when we get there is a very common catchphrase for me when I'm developing a game um, because I can, I feel like it's a skill to identify when you'll get more intel on how to make a better design decision based on what you're doing now. So you should wait until then rather than let's build a bunch of guesses that we're going to change in a month anyway once we learn more or let's trap ourselves with bad decisions that we made too early. Hmm. That sounds pretty wise. But Dan, yeah. I'm afraid we're running out of time. So sure. it's it's the moment for you to let us know where we can find more about you, about Filament Games, um, any, any you know, the webpage, the social media, all that jazz. It's, it's you know, that zone of the podcast where you, you pitch it all in. Um, because we're, we're at this point, certainly the audience is very curious to find about more about what you're doing and what, of course, what Filament Games is doing as well. Okay. Well, yeah. So you can definitely check out Filament Games at filamentgames.com. And I would love it if you guys should check out one of Filament's 
Our current premier internal project is called Roboco. You can access that through the Filament Games website as well, but we're, we're setting up Steam and getting that available on its own domain as well to check out. It's a VR and PC hybrid game about uh, building robots to solve problems. Uh, and uh, I think it may be the coolest thing we've ever made. So <laughs> <laughs> Until you build the next one, I'm sure. Yeah, yeah. I, uh, you know, I'm not even so sure about this. This, this, may be, this may be the apex. Maybe it's all downhill after this one. <laughs> we'll see. <laughs> Let's yeah, hope Robocop. not. Let's hope not. Yeah. So Dan, thank you very much for your time. I know that in these um, roughly 45 minutes or so that we've been spending together, um, you probably could have hashed out some ideas. You could have, you know, gotten down some more stuff in, in film and games and some games might have come out the, the bakery. But uh, we really appreciate that time that you spent with us, the, all that knowledge, all that wisdom that you've imparted over the engagers, our audience. But for now, for today at least, it is time to say that it's game over. Game over. Thank you so much. Hey, Engagers. Thank you for listening to Professor Game Podcast. And how are you listening to this podcast? If you're using a podcasting app, have you subscribed? Have you rated this podcast? Please, please, please do so. That way we can reach more Engagers like you to achieve our mission of making learning amazing using gamification and game-based learning. And if you want the instructions, you can go directly to professorgame.com slash iTunes. And before you go on to your next mission, would you like to know how Jesse Shell approaches significant, serious learning and all types of games? Then all you have to do is subscribe using your favorite podcast app and listen to the next episode of Professor Game. See you there. <laughs>